Today, I wanted to talk to you about how Itero has used its R&D focus to help steer our engineering and business decisions over the past three years, as well as the chemistry behind the challenges of the paralysis of waste plastics. I will also touch on the important but often overlooked challenges around the end-to-end -end plant design from a process design and operational perspective. But first, a quick introduction of Itero. There we are. Itero has been developing its pyrolysis technology for nearly 10 years. And over this time, we have designed two patented pyrolysis processes and designed two end-to-end -end plants, with our main focus being on the core technology which we'll be, we will be building and operating here at Brightlands. The core technology is a large-scale pyrolysis plant which operates an externally heated, continuous-fed screw auger. The plant will process over 27,000 tons of waste plastic per annum from a single module and be capable of operating with multiple modules in future plants. Our technology originates from the waste to energy sector, which means it's very robust in accepting contaminants through the process, including glass, metals, and biomass. These contaminants potentially affecting either or both yield and product quality, but not the integrity of our process plant. We also own and operate a pilot facility just outside of London in the UK, which, although it has a similar chamber size to our planned full-scale facility, it has a much reduced throughput capacity. We've operated this plant exclusively as an R&D facility for the past nearly two years. I'd like to discuss some of the key takeaways we've experienced operating this pilot in my talk today. Some pictures of the pilot. Our pilot plant is of sufficient scale that it can accept waste plastics of the same dimensions as we would expect to receive at the full-scale plant. It can process enough feedstock so that the variations in the feedstock makeup are reasonably blended over each test run to ensure a representative oil can be produced for analysis. Finally, our pilot has a fully automated control system, something I'll talk about a bit later. Both of these factors allow us to test many different types of waste at a real-world scale. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we first began our R&D testing, we devised the following three-step program for our pilot. Our first step was to try and really understand what happens when you pyrolyze polymers. We started with pure PP at different temperatures with different residence time, times, measuring and evaluating how the yield of the various fractions varied and how we optimized those yields. In this step, we looked at all the main polymer types, starting with polypropylene, moving on with similar tests to LDPE, HDPE, polystyrene, and PET. We then also blended each of the polymers in different ratios. The final step of this stage was to try and replicate the chemistry of plastic waste, but without any of the non-polymer contaminants, to understand some of the optimal conditions required for pyrolyzing a feedstock with this composition. The second stage was to accept waste plastics into the system, which we have now been doing since last July. We have run a variety of DKR products, DKR has been mentioned previously today, DKR products 310, 323, DKR 350, and DKR 352 through our plant, with varying degrees of pre-sorting applied by the waste manager. Again, these tests have been running at varying temperatures with different residence times in the heated environment. The final step, which we plan to commence very shortly, is to introduce additional contamination to the waste plastic feedstock into our system. We will then look at whether these, these contaminations manifest in particular products of the pyrolysis, i.e. whether they manifest in the gas, in the hydrocarbon wax, in the liquid, or in the char, and in what quantities. So this is what I might call the modus operandi behind the design of our R&D. An R&D program whose end product is a roadmap to making more educated decisions in the attribution of the value of specific waste plastic feedstock specifications into a commercial process plant. And we have learned hugely from all the 70 plus test runs that we've already performed at our plant in the UK. We designed our R&D program from a pretty scientific frame of mind, 
to better understand the differences between the input feedstocks transformed in our process with certain variable parameters and the impact this has had on the end offtake quality of the oil. Essentially, to try and work out the optimal feedstock from an economic as well as a chemical perspective, which via our process can produce the highest yield of valuable circular product. However, although we are a long way along in this journey and have not reached the end, we feel that we've learned an awful lot more than the results of the R&D have actually provided us. Because, having said all of this, the biggest learning for us and the factor which has been made the biggest impact on our plant design and operation recently has not come from the results of the R&D, as set out before. Instead, it is what we have learned from what has gone wrong in the past two years um, of running a pyrolysis plant, which has given us huge insights and has hugely influenced many aspects of our plant design. Indeed, in order to learn as much as we can, we have recently designed our R&D runs to push the boundaries such that we know it will result in some form of failure, so we can understand the extent of any future potential issues arising from this failure and how to, how to avoid them and how to fix them. In all honesty, it's been, to me, a bit of a revelation that we learn more by getting something wrong than achieving what we expect to without incident. But this is as long as you take both the time to understand why the failure has taken place and you learn from it to enable you to stop it in the future or minimize its impact. <clears throat> so, what have we experienced? We have experienced three main fail focus points within our system. Feedstock entry, management of the residual or if you like, the waste solid streams and the control systems. Firstly, feedstock entry. We have found that even putting aside the variations in the feedstock specification relating to the polymer and contamination makeup, it is the physical specifications and dynamics of the waste plastics that can cause significant issues to the entry of the feedstock into our system. Specifically, the feedstock density and particle size are particularly important. Increased moisture content also impacts density, even in plastics, and also impacts the heat transfer into the feedstock, and therefore the speed at which pyrolysis takes place. So we have spent a lot of time both reviewing the whole plastic feeding system of our plants, but specifically at the point where this intersects with the heated pyrolysis environment. Very dense feedstocks, such as pellets or agglomerated plastics, feed very easily, with certain less dense feedstocks sometimes causing issue, particularly if the particle size is large. We therefore need to understand the waste which is accepted into our system, both through a clear dialogue with the feedstock provider, but also a very robust quality control and assurance system. But no dialogue can be had or system created unless we understand exactly what attributes will or may cause problems. Secondly, the exit mechanisms for residual waste. At the end of each run, we open and thoroughly clean our pilot plant in order to fully diagnose any problems with the test run and highlight specific learnings. In our experience, these issues arise most often during the shutdown of our plant as the plant cools down from its high operating temperatures. We can see a good example of this in the top right picture where unpyrolyzed plastics have solidified as we did not complete the pyrolysis of, these, um, of these, this matter during the, the shutdown. In other words, we shut it down too quickly, the system cooled down too quickly, and basically there, were, there was unpyrolyzed plastics left in the organ. The problems arising from the bottom right picture arose because we were overcooling our char screw. So basically the, uh, the gases in the pyrolysis chamber were cooling in the exit for the char, in, and that was affecting the uh, the, the tar element of the, uh, of the product, and that was finding, basically, it was exiting in the wrong part of our system. Finally, bottom left picture, the control systems. So we've spent a lot of time creating and optimizing our fully integrated control system for the pilot plant, something that we'll look to replicate in the Brightlands plant that we're building. This allows the plant to be fully automated, including emergency shutdown procedures, as well as planned startups and shutdowns. It also provides us with second-by-second -second data analytics to help with our R&D. Our control system incorporates monitoring and operational procedures specifically designed for process safety and developed throughout our experience gained through the R&D process, 
for example, by virtue of, <coughs> excuse me, by virtue of accepting many diverse waste plastic specs specifications into our pilot, we were forced to adapt our system operating procedures to be more robust. But it can be overly sensitive. Sometimes a faulty sensor can trigger an automatic shutdown, which may or may not be capable of manual override. This certainly has caused a lot of frustrations for us, as often the reason for the shutdown is not immediately evident. So we try to learn from these fails and, for example, maybe incorporate either backup sensors to ensure faulty diagnoses are not made, or make processes in, particular, in particularly sensitive areas of our process plant more robust. So, by performing over the past nearly two years a series of R&D test runs, ITERO has benefited not just from the findings of these tests, but, has, but it has learned things of much greater value. It has been able to understand how our planned full-scale demo plant here at Brightlands is most likely to fail, and either designed to stop the failure or designed to minimize its potential impact. Failure in our pilot plant is much less expensive than failure in a full-scale demonstration facility. Failures also arise from operating procedures and human error, from operating systems, or even, as we have found, from variations in ambient temperature from day to day. By, le by learning through R&D, our pilot plant, before we even begin commissioning, sorry, I'll say that again. By learning through R&D in our pilot plant, before we even begin commissioning, we believe our pathway to success in the operation of our plant here in Brightlands will be much enhanced. Thank you.